Hey, this is Troy Taylor, the Troy Taylor from Richmond, Virginia. Not to be confused with Troy Taylor from Stanford. He was a lot better player than me. He's got a lot more money in his bank account. And Coach Franklin is here. He's from Kentucky. And I got Coach Mills from Chilhowee. And my dad's from Appalachia, Virginia. So we all are pr pretty much, we're probably all related. And I'm just so excited to have Jim McNally and now Coach Tony Franklin and Billy Mills on tonight. Coach Tony Franklin, could you introduce yourself to the clinic if there's anybody out there that doesn't know you? Just tell us a little bit about where you're from, Coach, and your story. I'm a background from Western Kentucky. I played uh, high school football at Caldwell County High School and I uh, played at Murray State for a couple of years. I was the worst running back in the history of the Ohio Valley Conference. Uh, I think I was the leading rusher at Murray State in 1976, and I averaged 2.9 yards per carry. So I was, I was kind of a speed guy. Um, but um, I got into high school coaching in 1979 and coached 16 years in the state of Kentucky, and uh, and then got in, into coaching in college at the University of Kentucky and. Um, coached, uh, I believe it's 21 years, was offensive coordinator at Kentucky, Troy, Auburn, Middle Tennessee twice, uh, Louisiana Tech once, and uh, University of California. So I've been a little bit of everywhere, about 41 years. I started a business many years ago, which is where Billy and I met um, as uh, the Coach Tony Franklin system. And um, we've been now running that for, we're on 20 year year number 23 actually starting now and billy has obviously been one of my been one of my best clients one of my most successful clients and uh he he now teaches me i don't teach him anything anymore so i'm excited to be on here with you troy yeah coach mills billy mills my great friend for so many years uh anybody that doesn't know this guy right here there's two uh, two of the best coaches in Virginia are in the Richmond area. And one's Lauren Johnson. He's won five state championships. And there's Billy Mills down in Dinwiddie. He's got two. And he just does it the right way. And there's just mutual respect between me and him and our programs. So, Coach Mills, for anybody that doesn't know, can you introduce yourself being from Chilhowee and Emory Henry College? Well, you took care of most of it there. I started <laughs> coaching down that area and uh, jumped around a lot for about – I guess, wow, about 13 years, I uh, went from uh, Saltville, Virginia, coached down in Northwood High School, uh, went to Kentucky, to Laurel County, and uh, went from there to Florida, to Bushnell, South Sumter, to, then from there to uh, Soddy Daisy, Tennessee, and then came back to Virginia at Rockbridge County for about five years, and I've been at Dinwiddie. I think this is uh, 17 years now, last 17. I've uh, been with Tony since 06, uh, you know, and uh, I, I was I was looking as I came in. I still, Tony, I still got that box of DVDs over there. I don't even think I can mm -hmm. play them on anymore. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great ride, and uh, I owe, owe, a lot of, owe a lot of the success that we've had here to uh, Tony, Tony Franklin. Yeah, man, I'm getting emotional just thinking about, man, the year. If anybody ever asked me who the best coach I've ever coached against is you, Billy. And um, I mean that, man. And, um, you know, I know Coach Franklin has been a big part of that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to offensive coordinators um, from Division One to NFL line coaches, and there ain't no better coach than that man right there in the bottom of the screen. He's the best coach in Virginia. And when I went to the convention – People just walk by him, and he's the one that everybody should be talking to because they don't know nothing compared to him. And, Coach Franklin, I listened to your podcast today about the State of the Union, and you're the president of the football coaches, and I, I feel honored. I would be like your uh, – I don't know. I guess I would be Delta Force. It's all <laughs> I would answer is to you, and I wouldn't look the part, but, you know, I'm willing to do whatever I need to do and work for whoever I need to work. Mm -hmm. So – would you like to just bring your State of the Union here to the Championship Football Coaches Clinic? Well, Coach, I'm here at, at, at your service, whatever questions you've got. But, you know, the funny I, I, thing. Go ahead, Coach. What's on a, your heart? A couple of things. Um, you know, talking about Billy, for, you know, young coaches that listen to this, 
anybody that's still coaching in the profession, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be great, you know, there's a lot of people that say they want to be great. You know, people use that, you know, I want to be great. I want to get this. And, and a lot of times what they want is they want what that brings to you. You know, they want the, they want the benefits of that, but they don't understand what goes into it. And don't get me wrong. There's some guys that, you know, were born on third base and act like they hit a home run. Uh, Billy did, Billy took the road to become a great coach by taking a lot of crap jobs and making them better, outworking everybody. And if, if, if anybody ever wanted to know how to do it, all you had to do was come to about 10 of my seminars in a row and just watch the coaches. And you'd see this guy that would always be sitting somewhere between row one and row four. He would have his notebooks laid out. And I could sit there and I could teach why cross for the 50th time to Billy. And he would finish when I finished teaching it, he would have another 10 pages of notes over the same things, you know, the same verbiage going back over it again. And the reason that, that Billy can out coach people is because he outworks people and not just to be putting in time to be putting in time. You know, I've watched Billy around his players. I've been fortunate to, to go and to watch Billy coach his kids and to hang around them, and especially during um, during the COVID experience, I was out of coaching uh, after you know one year of that, and was able to watch Billy and to see how much those kids admire him, how much they respect him because he genuinely cares. He's a tough, he's a hard ass that genuinely cares, which is the perfect combination to be a great football coach. And then he loves the game. He's always willing to learn more. You know, he's sitting here, like you said, you walk into a convention, people should be walking around wanting to meet him, wanting to hang around him, wanting to learn from him, want to cipher information off of him and all that stuff. When in reality, a lot of times they're chasing, you know, some young, some young sexy guy that they think is going to be something or some young GA from a college that they think already is something instead of really following the classics of somebody that's actually Done it. understands the game, how to work and how to get the best out of not only themselves, but how to get the best out of everybody else that is there. So, you know, I, Billy knows how I feel about him, and, and I know Billy uh, has, has helped me tremendously in, in my business, in my life, uh, et cetera. Uh, but today, you know, I talked about on my podcast about the state of football, and I, I, I made myself the self-proclaimed president of football for my State of the Union address. And... Um, you know, I tried to address high school, college, and, and pro, pro football just to see what the state of football is. And the one thing I hit on in, in high school football is um, dealing with what's going on right now in college football and how horrible it is for a high school kid that wants to play college football to be a high school player today because the game is the, – the, the way that recruiting has gone has changed so dramatically, especially now with COVID and the transfer portal. COVID gave everybody an extra year uh, that was in college football. So all of a sudden you got five years of overlays of kids still being there. And then you have the portal, which every FBS school and every lower level division one school, they think that's the answer to everything is let me take a bad player from Auburn. Let me take a bad player from North Carolina instead of recruiting a good player from Dinwiddie. And so what's happened is that you have this lowered standard of, of high school kids being recruited that are good enough. I watched film this year. I tried to help a young man that, whose father had played for me a long time ago, and the kid was a kid I would have recruited at every single college that I've been at, and I had a hard time finding one school to give him an offer. And it's just mind blowing to me that that's where the game is today. It's sad for kids. It's really sad for parents uh, that have waited this time for a kid to be recruited. And then finally, I guess the other thing, you know, I talked about the integrity of a college coach. If it were me, if I were a head high school coach these days, I would tell them when they come in the door, I'm so glad you're here. I am thrilled for you to be here. I'm gonna make it easy for you to recruit my kids. I'm going to give you everything you need. And the only thing you have to do, I'm only going to have one requirement for you. I'm going to do everything for you. I'm going to make your job easy. I'm going to give you everything that you need. Only thing you have to do is just one thing. All you have to do is be honest. 
Mm. That's it. End of story. If mm. you're honest and if you tell the truth, if you let us know, hey, Billy, I don't like your kid. I don't think he can play for us. I would say, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Or if you're saying, Billy, look, I got to bring five kids from your school or camp or that coach is going to eat my ass out. He's going to chew my ass out. Don't tell my kid you're interested in him and act like he's going to get a scholarship if he runs a four six at your school when it's all a lie and you're just trying to get him there as a number. All you got to do to me, one thing, this is not a hard game. All you got to do is look me in the eye and tell me the truth. You got to say, Billy, I'll tell you what we're doing. We're going to take two receivers this year. We're offering 12. You're number 12 on the list. Your guy's number 12. If one and two, three, four, five, or six say, yes, we're done with your guy. As a matter of fact, we're going to take his commitment if he wants to give it to us. But just so you know, if number three comes back and says, coach, Alabama dropped me, we're going to drop your kid. I just need to know because I got to keep his options off everywhere. All we got to do is play this game straight. If you do that, you and I will have a great relationship. If not, you hurt one of my kids. You hurt these parents. You make me look like a fool because I trusted you. You lie. You text my kid to drop him. You do that, and here's where you're going to go. We're going to have a little plaque up here, and it's called the Hall of Shame. Your name's going to go right on there, and you're not welcome in my, my, my building. Don't get me wrong. I want you to come. I want my kids to be recruited by you. It's good for you to walk in our doors. And I'm not asking you for anything but one little bitty thing. Don't lie. That's it. End of story. If it's, that's too hard for you, then you know what? You don't ever need to come here to begin with. So that was kind of part of the little deal today on the State of the Union address. What, what, where does pro football fit in this? The money is the – what is it? The love of money is the root of all evil? So well, the head of the snake? To me, pro football doesn't really matter to high school stuff. The only thing pro football affects high school is by kids watching and the image that they take from that. And they say, okay, like I got a great quarterback and he wants to be Pat Mahomes and he's 5'8 and he runs a 5'6'40 and he can barely grip a football in his hand. And he's got some guy telling him you need to run sideways and throw it underhanded. Oh, and you mean a ball. drill? A <laughs> drill for that? I've seen yeah. it, coach. Yeah. Throwing late across the middle? Ain't that the golden rule? Here's the, here's the you rule I give. Late across the middle. The rule I give to quarterbacks is this, uh -huh. is that you're going to do what I do, how I tell you to do it, until you prove to me that you do something that I go, wow. My rule then is shut up. Yeah, leave them alone and shut up. But until that time, you're going to do what I tell you to do, how I tell you to do it. Now, when you become better, when you can do things that I can't coach, and I've had every good quarterback has done things that I can't coach, and the best thing you can do as a coach then, shut up, leave it alone, and let them play football. And sometimes it's going to be not exactly the way you draw it up, not exactly the way you want it. And mm -hmm. guess what? They're going to make you look really good, and then they're going to leave. And everybody's going to call you a guru. And then the next guy comes in and you're going to go, whoa, I know yeah. I ain't nearly as smart as I thought I was. Man. I mean, that's the thing I love about you. We've never met. I've never talked to you, uh, Tony Franklin, but your Twitter is wonderful. Your Twitter is giving knowledge to our game. And Billy Mills, what is the name of your offensive lineman? Who looks like Morgan Moses that plays for the Ravens? What is his uh, name? Colin Jackson. Colin Jackson will play pro football one day. Robert Prunty is the smartest coach in America, the head coach at Hampton that offered that kid a scholarship. I've only seen three or four of him in 24 years of coaching. I saw him when he was an eighth grader. He played JV. I knew he was an eighth grader because if he was in a ninth grader, he would have been starting. <laughs> for Dinwiddie. That's why I knew he was an eighth grader because we can't play eighth graders in Virginia. That young man will play pro football. He's going to make a lot of – a lot of people are going to say, how in the world did he end up at Hampton? Because there's a lot of stupid coaches out there that didn't offer a guy that looks like Makai Becton that plays for the Jets, Morgan Moses that plays for uh, 
the Ravens, and the kid that goes to UNC from LCA. That's the only kids I've ever seen that look like him. Billy Mills, we're having a kumbaya, a come together. Now, I'm not in charge of this. The Lord is. He's the one that made this happen. So go ahead. And what's on your heart, Billy Mills, and your State of the Union? Because I guess you're the vice president. <laughs> no, not, not even close. Uh, I think Tony, you know, I listened to the same, just got off the run there and I came in. I was listening to Tony's uh, podcast as I do, you know, almost daily. But uh, he was talking about the extra year that they all got with COVID and how it affected recruiting. And not just that, but the uh, transfer portal. Well, you know, most uh, your normal, you know, everyday high school kid, parent, that, that, that I'm dealing with, you know, they, you know, they may or may not know this situation, you know, and all they know is, is, you know, five years ago, so-and-so that played for Dinwiddie was getting all these opportunities, getting all these offers. And now they're not, this guy's not, it doesn't make no sense. And, you know, it always as as a lot of stuff does, you know, every, everything that goes right or wrong in a program uh, you know, falls on me, but, uh, you know, try to educate him on, on what was going on and try not to let it get to him. But he's a great kid. I mean, if there's one person in this school, uh, that you wanted to hand deliver a scholarship offer to, it was Colin Jackson. I mean, he's done everything. What test doesn't he pass? No, he, he's all the grades are the film. Yeah, he's done he's everything right now for most yeah. colleges. Yeah, he's been in the best program in Virginia from the best coach. Yeah, but you know you can't. I don't know. You know sometimes, you know it's like the. You know, I know this is going through the same thing with my linebacker. Uh, everybody's waiting on that one guy to do it first. Uh, you know they kind of like what they see, but they don't want to be the first guy to. To jump in, but uh, you know, you got some no brainers like our quarterback. I mean, you know, everybody's everybody wants him, but you know, most of the kids in your program they, they fall in that they fall in that range where you know they go here or there, and it might be uh division three or division two, it might be division two, or uh, you know, what what used to be one double A, and and you know, it, it that's really the 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 challenge of a high school coach is, is, is getting your kids over those humps and helping them navigate that. Um, and it's, it, you know, Tony's right. I mean, it's, it's an ugly, ugly game. And if you can find guys out there that are honest, you know, you latch onto those guys and you, and, 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 and you, you, you use those guys, you know, because you got a bunch out there, man, that are just, I mean, they'll just they'll just take a, a crap on a kid, man, in a heartbeat, and you know they're not they're not welcome back in my school, you know, and they they may not care, but uh, no, they don't care. But they're not coming back in Dinwiddie. They're not recruiting our kids anymore. My dad told me that if you're a high school coach, and my dad wasn't, my dad was a, a Marine. He said, Troy, you're a high school coach. They're college coaches. They need you more than you need them. Because I had a coach tell me that I didn't have any players. And I know who he is, and he knows who he is. He's probably going to watch this. And he don't have to come by my school. But one day I will. All right? And you'll probably be looking for a job next week. Uh, coach Franklin, I'm glad you're a part of this. Because we're, we're really we're, – we're getting to it. Uh, what's on your heart? Well, I mean, the main thing is, is I think that the, the – as a high school football coach, and, and to me, it's just a standard that I have in life. Um, it's called do good, no repay. And that is, is that um, every single day that you go in and that you're a teacher and you're a coach or a human being, it doesn't really matter what it is, but as a, as a teacher and a coach in the high school setting, you have the best opportunity of almost any human being in the world to do good for somebody that can never repay you as long as they live. And as long as every day of your life, if you do that, if you find some human in the world that you could do something for to help them to have a better life, but you don't expect anything in return. A lot of times we do things and we think, yeah, I'm doing this because this guy may do this one day and it may come back and help me. And that's OK. But the greatest thing that we can all do as humans every day is to try to find another human 
that sometimes it's real simple. Like I used to have kids in college and I would do this and every year. I would say, do good, no repay. That's our philosophy. I want you to learn about this. And they'd say, coach, well, give, you know, can you give us some examples? How can I do that? I don't have any money to help somebody with. How do I do that? I said, I can tell you, it's really simple. There's somebody in the cafeteria at school right now that sits by themselves. There's somebody walking down the hallway today that's going to get their books knocked out by a bully. There's some young lady in the school that people are going to make fun of. All you have to do is be the kind person. All you have to do is give them a truly heartfelt gesture to make them feel good. Because the one thing that we all want every single day of our lives, we all want to feel like that we have value as a human being. We want to feel like that we have something that other people appreciate. And if we do that, then we've lived a pretty good life. We've had a pretty good day. So as a high school football coach, I, you know, when young people talk to me and they say, you know, coach, I really want to be a coach. I'd love to be a college coach, et cetera. And I'll tell them this. I'll say, well, first of all, who do you know? You know, is your daddy a coach? Because if your dad, They always ask me, what's the best way I can become a college coach? And I said, well, the number one or best NFL. way is for your daddy to be a coach. And that's no offense to the guys out there whose daddy is a college coach, because I don't blame you. I would use every advantage in the world. Just again, don't act like you hit a home run when you were born on third base. But if your daddy's not a coach, the next best thing that you can do Ooh. is go befriend somebody. You need to befriend someone that's going to climb the ladder, be their best friend, be valuable, to, be valuable to them, work a camp. But when all that's over and done with, here's what I suggest to you. Go somewhere and coach where football matters. Mm. Okay. Go somewhere that football matters to the people in that community. Coach there. And I can tell you this, in one year, in high school football, you will make a larger impact than in 20 years of coaching college football. Wow. In one year in high school football, you can take a seventh grader, a ninth grader, an 11th grader, a 12th grader, and you can literally save their life. I'm talking about save their life. Man. You can put them on a row to get them out of what they're in. You've got a kid that comes in that's hungry, you can feed him. You got a kid that was abused, you can get him out of that environment. You can protect him. You got a kid that all he knows is, is his family is, is breaking the law and that's all he knows, you can keep him out of prison. You can't In college, you can make a difference every now and then, but more than likely by the time you get an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, sure, I feel really good about what I did as a college coach. But I can tell you this, one or two years in high school, I made a thousand times more difference than 20 years in college because they're so hungry and they need you so much then. They're not completely developed yet. And so for young people that are coaching and you think that, oh man, I'd love to be the running back coach at Michigan making <laughs> 600 grand a year. Sure, that's great. The check cash as well, it's a lot easier. Hey, I got to give you a secret. All these college coaches that bitch and gripe and complain about how hard college is, just if they're in a power five school, just tell them to go away. You know, I don't want to hear it. They got money, the money the most I say. in 30 years. So just, you know, they get go paid out. five history classes, teach five history classes, still get to work at 530 in the morning, teach five history classes, have a mom chew you out coming off the field because little Johnny didn't play this week. Or so-and-so, you know, instead of getting in for three snaps like he did the week before when you blew somebody out, he didn't get to play, whatever it may be. That's the daily life of a, of a high school football coach. And you're going to work for peanuts compared to what a Power 5 coach is working for. But again, the standard of your living, if you can survive, and you can, then you're going to thrive and you're going to make a gigantic difference in this world. So I've done both. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather be a college coach if I can get the big check because it's an easier job. But I would give nothing for those 16 years as a high school coach when I every single day, not that I was right all the time because I made mistakes as a high school coach too, but I, I, I made some differences of people that today, 40 to 50 years old, that have come back to me and said, thank you, man, you really did save my life. Billy, what's on your heart? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I think Tony hit it on the head. Uh, you know, that's 
when when it gets past the, the wins and losses and this, that, and the other, it's those and so you look back at at what kind of impact are you making? And uh and when you put your head on a pillow at night, did you make a difference in today in this world? And I think as a you know, I think you can do it at any any profession, to be honest with you, I really do. But uh you know, we definitely have uh, a lot of opportunities as a high school football coach just because, you know, every kid has got something going on more than likely uh, and, uh, you know, goes past, you know, his drill work and what he needs to improve on as a player. So, you know, I think Tony hit that right on the head. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i a 44-year-old man, and I had Jim McNally tell me today that I was above average. And just him telling me that made me feel like a million dollars. I had Tony Elliott tell me when I was calling out his plays at UVA's practice, I did a good job, and he yelled at me. That made me feel like a million dollars. Coach Cheetah from Virginia Tech, he, he told me that I had uh, elite energy and charisma. That made me feel like a million dollars. Uh, Coach Brent Pry, whose dad played at Buffalo, um, and Coach – uh, uh, McNally knows is coming on the podcast tomorrow. That means everything to me that he, that he's willing to do that. And, you know, coach Franklin, I mean, I told him that I knew Mike Finoga. They coached together at Kentucky. It's a small world. I mean, me and Billy Mills, we are the, we are the picture of sportsmanship and we're the picture of being competitors because it's a war. He's like a Confederate general. And I guess I'm like Ulysses S. Grant. Co- Coach Franklin, I mean, everybody – the old saying is high school coaches want to go to college, college coaches want to go to the NFL, and NFL guys just want to coach and, and go back to high school. I mean, is is that what what you've seen, that guy, some guys just want to get to the next level, move up? Well, I think that I think that everybody has some type of ambition, whatever that ambition is. I've met a lot of great high school football coaches that have no desire, zero, to go to college, the NFL. They love what they do. Mm-hmm. They know the impact they make. They like seeing their family. They like seeing their children. They like yeah. being a real dad. You know, there's been a lot of coaches that I've known over the years that might brag and say, you know, I don't even know my kid's birthday. I don't even – I don't get to go and do this or that. I haven't done this. I hadn't. Well, to me, you know, that just shows a lack of being, you know, how do you teach your players to be good parents? You're telling them to be good parents. You're telling them family matters the most and yet you ignore your family completely. So, but there's a lot of good human beings in college football as well. It's like everything. There's good people on, on both sides. And my daughter reminds me of this. One of my daughters told me this and some of the trials and tribulations that I've been through, where I've gone to war with, with universities, or I've gone to war with powerful people. And when you get in a war and you're in a, and, and you're in a fight with somebody over whatever the deal is. And, and uh, in my case, it was something that I believe was life and death. When you get into that, you can eventually see things and you can see somebody as being a monster. And my daughter reminded me of this. And she said, dad, we all have monster in us. We all have evil in us. Mm. You know, some people are perceived to be really good and they do some good stuff and then they do some really evil things. There's some people who are pure evil that actually do some really good things. We've all got a little bit of it in us. And then somewhere along the way, we'll either go in one direction or we'll go in the other. And for a lot of people, I think that you find out it's like, I would never do that. I would never do that. But, and then I get offered a half a million dollars a year. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in other words, you would always have done it. It was just a matter of they hadn't reached your price yet. For $50,000 a year, I'll have integrity. But for $5 million a year, I'll lose that integrity. No, all it was was a series of negotiations to see what it took for you to lose your integrity because you, you never had it. And so it doesn't mean that any of us are – all good or all bad. We're all, you know, we all have some goodness in us and we all have some bad things in us. And, you know, it's a constant never ending battle to a degree. Mm -hmm. But for me, sometimes for me, there's things that are crystal clear. It's either black or white. And, and like I know in my last little 
deal that I had my last year of coaching in college football, it was, it was to me a simple decision of if, if I ignore this, then I've been a phony my entire life. Mm. If I ignore this, just because it's going to cost me my career, mm-hmm. just because no one will ever hire me again, as long as I live. If I ignore that, if I ignore this situation, if I just do what everybody else does, I just keep my mouth shut. If I do that, I can stay in this game. I can mm. stay in this business. I can still be on that deal. But if I do, it means that every time I look in the mirror, I get to tell myself that I was a complete phony my entire life. So I think that you're that that all of us are constantly in this game of life to where you have to know really who you are. The one thing about me is that I'm very comfortable with who I am. Doesn't mean I'm always right. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with me because a lot of people disagree with me tremendously on a lot of things. But I'm very comfortable with who I am. I'm comfortable making the decisions that I make even though people don't agree with those decisions. And I think that, um, like you said, the the game, high school, college, NFL, I've met good people at each level. I've met really bad people at each level. Yeah. And high school coaches, do all of them want to be college coaches? Absolutely not. And I'll tell you this, just so you guys understand, I've coached against the best in the world, the, the guys that are making the $5 million, $10 million a deal. The best – And the most difficult coaching for me has always been going against a good high school coach. I've been in state championship games and I've been sitting there. I ain't got a good play because this guy's smarter than I am and he's beating my ass. I've coached against guys making the millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'd love to face this guy every week. This is like stealing. (laughs) A lot of times we get a reputation of being something that is just because we had better players than everybody else. And then all of a sudden you got to coach, you got to coach them up. As they all used to say, you got to, you got to get them better. You got to coach them up. And there's some guys that can do that. And then there's some guys that can't. The moment that they got players that are equal, they get their ass handed to them. Now, when they got better than you, a lot better than you. Yeah. They're bullies and they walk around bullying. The moment they get like this and all of a sudden they're complaining and griping and, you know, crying and everything else under the sun. So, you know, there's a lot of good, a lot of bad, just like there is in every other phase in the world. Yeah. I mean, Billy Mills, when Shane Reynolds told me that he had a talk that he had given at the system clinic that was about a program that I was a big part of, that made me feel like, wow, like Billy Mills thinks I'm a good coach. When Billy Mills said that I was one of the best coaches that – he's ever coached against that, that made me, because what's that saying? Don't take advice from, don't take criticism from people that you wouldn't take advice from. Like that, that, that made me feel good about myself. Billy, what, what is Tony Franklin meant to you? Oh, wow. You know, uh, man, everything, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know Tony, uh, I, you know, I, I just heard of Tony, you know, uh, before I had some mutual friends, uh, they were already clients of Tony's. Uh, they had already been using the system for a while till I saw them and, and they really talked me into it. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, I tell my players at the beginning of every year that if they're going to get in the car and their mom's going to say, that's ridiculous. And that guy's crazy. You know, I told them, Tell your mom that she's exactly right, that that I am ridiculous and I am crazy. And that's what it takes for us to be different. And, uh, you know, so that first, you know, that first uh, seminar that I went to, I was going. What year? This was 2006. I'd already talked my uh, O-line coach into uh, getting some tickets on some kind of flyer, frequent flyer miles or something another he had. We were going down to uh, to uh, see Coach Leach, and when he was at Texas Tech, you know, because at the time uh, Tony wasn't coaching, uh, you know, coach, you know, I knew I had I had Hal Mummy's notebook in my hand. Uh, I knew I wanted to do this stuff, but I didn't really have a grasp of it. You know, we had averaged ten points a game, and I had to figure something out. And, and I, I can't, you know, 
I can lose like a man, but I hate losing. I really hate, despise losing. And, uh, you know, it's not something I think that uh, the necessity of not wanting to lose and wanting to compete and not being content with, hey, we probably got three or four more years of this till, you know, the weight room will catch up or till somebody gets on board. Um, I just couldn't imagine doing that. And, you know, so we were headed down to Lubbock. Uh, and then I talked to uh, a couple of guys that were on that flyer that Tony sent out. And uh, I told him, I said, hey, can you get these things changed to Nashville? I said, there's a seminar, in, uh, a Tony Franklin seminar. And uh, I went to my AD and I said, uh, hey, uh, you think you, you think we could go to this? You know, you think you could pay for it? And, you know, uh, I mean, I like the fact that Tony ain't made this thing. Uh, it, it shouldn't be super cheap. I mean, daggone, there's the stuff that, that you get out of this, if you really dig into it, uh, you know, it, it's really a bargain. I mean, there ain't no doubt about it. And especially now, but, uh, but, you know, I talked, I told my AD, I said, Hey, you know, will you pay? So well, I'm not paying for this. I said, all right. I said, well, you take my, you know, who I'm talking about too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, know. I, said, I, know. I said, I said, well, then I want to take my supplement that you were going to pay me to coach this past year. Uh, I said, I want you to use that to, to send us to, to this wow. seminar. And uh, so, you know, that's how we got to go to the first one. And I went and, and I, you know, I, I came back with, with three notebooks full of stuff and, and my head was spinning and I had not a clue. And we started trying to do stuff and, you know, uh, it was about, it was working. But then we, uh, we were on these phone calls that Tony would do, uh, I guess monthly or something. Um, and they were talking about coming down to camp and I'm like, all right, let's go to camp. And, uh, you know, the camp was in was it Troy. Was that the yeah. name? Of the town? Yeah, I, was, I was in Troy then. Yeah. I said, I said, Hey, we, I went talk, told my principal, I said, we need to go to camp in, uh, uh Troy, Alabama. And, my, <laughs> and my, she looked at me kind of crazy cause you know, she, but at this point, I think Miss Pittman was used to, to, to me saying some, some off the wall stuff. So, I mean that, you know, that it, it wasn't that bad, but, uh, we went down there, and, and I, I remember I picked up Buzz. Uh, we picked up you, – you remember Buzz? We, uh, yeah. Buzz that, was, that was Buzz's first day on the job is Buzz showed up here, got into a bus, uh, and we went to Troy, Alabama. And I said, you mm -hmm. follow that more around. And mm -hmm. my receiver coach has, had already been here a couple of weeks. I said, you get in the car, and you come on. I said, you follow Neil Brown around. He, and you just hired Neil. And uh, I guess when we were there in 06, I guess that was the first uh, you had – I may have announced at that time that you were going to Troy. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's I was, there, I was there in 06 was my first year there. Uh, yeah. So I was there in 06 and 07. Yeah, so we that was our first seminar when you announced that. And I guess you, you talked about Neil uh, in our podcast. We were talking about – yeah, I remember Neil coming back there in the back and doing that uh, presentation back there when he was at uh, was it was it uh, Maine or, or uh, he was at some I, I can't even remember the school that we hired him from because I remember I remember when we hired him you know we we paid him like a grand total of about thirty thousand dollars uh, <laughs> to come down and be the receiver coach at Troy and I remember he was nervous because he was about ready to get married I'm like oh, you know. Well, I don't understand why you got to go, you know, take a honeymoon or anything. You know, I don't need you to miss work. Uh, but, you know, obviously it turned out pretty good. It's funny because when you talk about that, you had, you had Neil that I hired and you had a guy by the name of Chad Scott that was just named the offensive coordinator at West Virginia. Chad had never coached a day in his life. He was mm -hmm. living in the video room at North Carolina, just doing video work and, and actually sleeping in there. And I had a guy named Matt Moore that had never coached in college that I hired Matt and he's now, the old line guy there. So and we had Shane was that was a really good coach. And Shane was like me. He was just no high school coach that had been at Troy for a couple of years. And, and uh, we all got together and did some good stuff. And the camps were amazing though. I mean, the camps, you know, back when I was doing those, that was when it was really, yeah, I mean, it was so cool because guys could go and get all that information. And then man, in three days, we just absolutely killed it. You know, I mean, we just absolutely went at it. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's when we really figured out that, hey, we, 
we weren't exactly applying the notes that we had taken like we should. And that was kind of a missing piece for us. And we saw that. And then Tony would, would have us, uh, you know, would have us do stuff the last day. And then he'd kind of, you know, what I, you know, Tony was, had spoke on this a little bit earlier about, you know, the, about the honesty. And I think that's, that's where that, uh, you know, you, you learn to respect somebody the most is, you know, just when they're, when they're their self. I mean, when you do this stuff forever, uh, you know, you know the difference uh, between real and, 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 and not real. And, and I can tell you, Tony's as genuine as you get. I mean, Tony would tell you, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to rip your ass if you get this stuff wrong, you know, <laughs> and he would. He would, and you appreciated that, but you also didn't want to do it wrong. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, we went to every camp coming or going. That same day, that same camp we went to, by the way, in Troy, we drove back uh, to uh, Dinwiddie, went to sleep, got up, and then went to uh, Morgantown, West Virginia, to play in their seven-on-seven -seven tournament. Wow. You know? And uh, <laughs> You're a psycho. <laughs> that was our uh, – that was our intro into this. And then, you know, I can remember we were doing our first, uh, I do this in my screen presentation because Tony said, you do screens. He said, you do screens. That's the first thing you got to be able to do. You do them when they don't work, you know? And, and I said, right, we're going, we're going to do this completely. I said, you know, I don't think you can do something halfway. If we're going to do it right. You know, I think we got the ingredients to do it. And, I can remember uh, we're playing uh, Halifax. This was 06. This was uh, this was our first game, and we'd done went out and done all this, went to Troy and everything. And I can remember, uh, you know, I don't remember when it was, but it was like the second quarter, and 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 they the, Halifax was pretty good. They had those three kids that went to uh, North Carolina. They were D one guys, and we we had. We hadn't done anything. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, Adam Morgan pops up, hits my receiver coach now, Daquan Coles, on a on a screen. You look at everybody else, and they did everything wrong. I mean, and we're on wristbands. I mean, they looked at the wristband and did it wrong. <laughs> they, and the, but we all we did was snap and throw, and, and Daquan went 70 yards for a touchdown, and from that point on, everybody that we play were saying, watch, including you, were saying, mm -hmm. watch the screens. You know, so, I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, that kind of got us going. And then we kept going back year after year after year. And some people would say, well, why are you going back? Uh, you've already got the stuff. Why are you doing this? And, I mean, I even had other clients ask me that. Stuff. I'm like, dude, you don't – you don't like – going to church. Every year we go back, we get something else. We either get something that we didn't get to the first place uh, that we needed, uh, needed, or Tony has went out because because at this point Tony Tony was was still competing at the highest level, so he was get, he was going out and doing the same things that we were, and we were he was sharing that stuff with us, you know. So we were ahead of the game, you know. Like so, like Tony, we were called. We were we were doing RPOs before they even had a art a name, mm -hmm. you know. Before they even was a, they even called it RPOs, you know. We were doing, uh, you know, the the tempo stuff before before it got in vogue. I mean, we were we were probably two or three years. And Tony would tell us, say, "Hey, don't you say nothing about this stuff," you know. He said, well, "We got probably two three years before this gets out," and he said, "Then it's going to be everybody's doing it." So, you know. It's 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 definitely been one of the best things that I ever done. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's 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 helped. It's changed. Uh, it's changed this program. It's changed my life. Uh, you know, so I mean, I'm truly two state championships since then. What's your winning percentage? Eighty percent or yeah. better? Yeah. So I mean, anybody that's watching this from out of state, I mean, this is the best coach in Virginia right here, and Co Coach Tony Franklin's played a huge role in that and we're documenting history y'all i mean we're we're documenting the history of y'all's relationship uh today uh coach franklin i didn't know um coach leach but when he passed away it bothered me bad why 
And why is that, Coach? I mean, it was so many people that didn't know him that were so bothered. Well, I think that you know, I worked with Mike for two years, and and I think that I think that the thing that that probably hit the football world is that everybody that watched Mike Leach coach felt like that they were his buddy <laughs> because because he was he was different. You know, you asked him a question about quarters coverage, and he would tell you about a mosquito um, that was uh, in India. And, yeah. you know, we'd spend uh, six days on it. And I'll never forget, you know, I talked uh, to different people when Mike passed away. And um, um, I remember when Mike, well, my first meeting with Mike was, I was like, this guy can't be a football coach. There's no way in the world because, you know, I meet him in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And, you know, he was, didn't have, didn't give me the time of day. I didn't spend five seconds with him and I went there twice. And so I didn't walk away, you know, impressed with this guy in any form or fashion. Well, then eventually, long story short, I helped Hal get the job at Kentucky. Mike comes. So I'm there as the liaison when they first get there and we're at the state championship game and I haven't been hired yet. Nobody really knows I'm going to be hired and I'm introducing the staff and it's like a 35 degree day. It's freezing and Mike's there. And I think he had on shorts and doesn't, you know, it's got, he's dressed like, like he's never been dressed before. You know, there's nothing at all. And so I got buddies coming up to me, you know, high school coaching buddies coming up going, Hey man, seriously, who is that dude? There's no way in the world he's going to coach at Kentucky. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, he's like, you know, Coach Mummy's right-hand man and everything. And I'm I'm thinking the same thing. I'm thinking, like, who who is this guy, you know? And I knew they'd been together and all that. But I think the reason that, that the coaching profession felt like they were all his friend and like they all knew him was because they branded the Air Raid so well that everybody – feels like that, you know, if I run Y cross, I'm part of the Air Raid family. And so uh, they're Mike Leach's brother. Yes. Sure. And, you know, how mummy's son. And so they did a really good job of doing that over the years of branding that. But I think that Mike's, I think that Mike's uniqueness and the fact that he seemed when people would see him on television and doing all these different things is that it made them feel comfortable. And the thing that like attracted me to this way of playing football, when I first met Hal Mummy and I first had Coach Mummy draw up something and, you know, start talking about mesh or white cross or whatever, it was the first time that a football coach that was a quote somebody that I felt like I understood what they were talking about. It was like, you know, you guys run here and, you know, we're going to look at this guy and if he's open, we're going to throw it to him. And I'm like, that's it? Yeah, but if he's not open, we're going to go to this guy and we're going to throw it to him if he's open. And if he's not open, we're going to look at this guy and throw it to him. So it wasn't like, you know, when you would go to the clinic and a guy would get up there and talk and he was like, oh, my God, these buzzwords he's using. And, you know, they're in this coverage, but this guy does this and this guy does this and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I'm like, this is like when I was in sophomore chemistry and I had no idea what that guy was talking about. That's how I felt when I walked out of a coaching clinic. But when when Hal Mummy and then eventually Mike Leach would explain, you know, how to run certain things, I would go, okay, I'm smart enough to do this. I can teach this because these guys, and you know, a lot of times people would say they're not telling us everything because yeah. there's got to be some deeper secret to this. No one would do that. No one, and I used to think the same thing. And, you know, it took me on an airplane ride with Chris Hatcher going to Salt Lake City and then Missoula, Montana, back in the spring of 1998. It took me going on that plane ride before I ever really understood exactly what this offense meant. And Hatcher basically saying, dude, don't make this hard. Yeah. This is easy. And I think Hatcher probably – in all honesty, this is a story that not many people know. So you're going to get the exclusive right here. Wow. Forward, okay. And this hasn't really come out <laughs> in many places, but this is a true story. When Hal Mummy went to Valdosta State, he and Mike Leach, they had this little quarterback named Chris Hatcher who would go on to be the Harlan Hill Trophy winner. He would then go on to be a GA. 
become the young head coach at Valdosta State at age 26, win national championship. Now he's, in my opinion, one of the best coaches in all of football, head coach at Sanford, you know, went 12-1 and one this year, got beat at North Dakota State in the playoffs. What Hatcher did was that when they brought the offense to Valdosta, the offense was more complicated than it is today. They did everything right and left. Whereas all the air raid people out there know the Y always lines up on the right. The X is always on the left. Z always on the right. And then the H can move back and forth. Okay. So all the old air raid people, they all know that, right? When they were learning the offense, when they went to Valdosta in those years, they were doing everything both sides. And Hatcher said he was so confused. He, he was all over the place. And finally, like mommy said, look, screw this. We'll just run it everything from the right side. And in all, not that they weren't good at Iowa Wesley, and they were, but they were at Valdosta. And the moment they went to this, where all they did was the offense basically as a right handed offense, mm-hmm. when they did that, that's when everything went through the roof. And so over all the years, I think the one thing that happened with Coach Leach is that. He stayed simple. He stayed the way that it was. Not that he didn't tweak a few things over the years. You know, not that there's not some little wrinkles that he ran at Mississippi State that he didn't run at Texas Tech. But there's probably 90% of what he did the last season he coached was what he did at Kentucky and Oklahoma. And in all honesty, I think he even got more simple the years that went by. Because when we were at Kentucky, we got in big sets. We got in the offset eye. We got under the center. We used a tight end. We did all of that stuff that Mike eventually didn't do any of that as the years went by. He got completely away from it and was basically either a you know blue or green to the old air raid guys, two back, three wide, but he never used tight ends in the later years. So, Billy, how, how did you feel when, when Coach – Leach passed away and, you know, being connected to this offense and, you know, through Coach Franklin being connected to him. Well, I mean, it was a shocker, obviously, because, I mean, it was so unexpected, um, you know, and then you you feel for his family and everybody else involved in Mississippi State and everybody like that. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, 100 uh, my only connection with him was really that story I told, uh, and that hey, we were going down there, uh, and then and then you know Tony would tell the story every now and then of of, of teaching wide receivers leverage and leaning, and he'd tell that story and everything. But really, I mean, I mean, I don't I don't know how Tony feels about this or what, but I I wouldn't connect what Tony, I mean, there's some, there's some aspects of the air raid uh, in what Tony's done, but I, to me, Tony has taken that and and improved upon the product. If you, if you might say, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, uh, because, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think that, that throughout the time, you know, you know, Coach Leach, wherever he was, would light up the, the stat page with, with passing. But, I mean, at the end of the day, um, as a high school head coach, you know, don't tell me how much we've thrown for. I mean, we've thrown probably the most we've ever thrown for in 2006 and went three and seven. Uh, I want to win football games. And, you know, I think what Tony's done with his system – is, is more adapted to that. And mm-hmm. you know, what does it take for us to win? And, and and when I try, people say, describe what, describe your offense. Is it this? Is it that? And, and, and basically it's, it's, you know, where is the defense putting those 11 pieces and what do we need to do to exploit that? And whether that be throw the ball, run the ball, screen them, uh, RPO, whatever it is, you know, that's what this system has taught me is how to how to take what the defense is doing, use it against them, uh, which you know has led to more more wins. So, 
I mean, I, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. I but, think it's a great answer. But, uh, you because know, lead I would, me to my next question. I wouldn't connect those two. I mean, I think that's kind of the first podcast when your assistants did it with me. They were kind of leaning toward that. And I kind of said that then. Uh, you know, we're not really air raid. Uh, you know, do we run cross? Absolutely, we run cross. Uh, you know, are there aspects of it? But like I said, I think Tony's taken it and, and – ran with it and and made it better because one thing that, that that I think he hit on is it is simple. I mean, I mean I'm with Tony. I've went to those same clinics and you hear those coaches talk and sometimes it's like they're using these words to to confuse you on purpose or make themselves sound better. Or, I'm not really sure, but I never understood what the hell they were saying. You know, I understood what Tony was saying. I could yeah. take that back and tell a, a quarterback, hey that, you know, uh, you know, right now we're doing quarterback school and they're like, well, you know, I'll have, uh, uh, I'll draw it up there and I'll be about the grass and I'll have a younger quarterback. It's that's went to a guru somewhere say, well, what, what, you know, is that coverage? And my older quarterback will look at him and say, dude, we don't talk coverage around here. Where's grass. He said, you, you may not even be able to tell what coverage they're in as fast as we play. He said, so, you know, it's, he's, we make stuff, we can make stuff way too hard, uh, and to me, that's the last thing you want to try to get your kids to do is that kind of stuff. Well, they don't need to. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't call ourselves air raid. I think uh, uh, they've kind of stayed on that same keel and, like, this is the way it is, and we're going to do it this way. And where Tony's been more uh, where I, where I want to be is that, all right, we don't have this kid this year. We're still trying to win. All right, so what do we do now? And mm -hmm. that's that's where that's why I've been with him for as long as I have, and we'll, we'll continue to be with him as long as he does anything. So yeah, yeah. It, you know, and it's been a constant evolution, Troy. Yeah, it has. I, the the, the so, whole deal for me has been is that I've been fortunate that I've gone to lots of different places, so I've had different type of talent, but I continued to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, my my philosophy is real simple is that you do what it takes to win. And I don't believe you win championships just throwing the ball. Mm -hmm. I think that to win a championship, two things are always there. Is that number one, you have to be at least average on defense, if not better. Sometimes great defense can take care of a bad offense and you can still win a championship. But you need to be at least average on defense. Number two is you have to be able to run the ball. Now, that doesn't mean you have to run it 40 times a game if you only get 60 snaps. But what it does mean is that there's going to come at least two to three games every season, no matter what, that the quarterback is off, that the receivers are off. That's true. That the weather causes a problem, something, to where you're going to have to run the ball to win the game. Mm -hmm. So as time went by for me, as evolving as a football coach, it's that I've got to be able to win no matter what. How do we win championships? And every championship I've been a part of, those things were always there. We we're always at least average on defense, if not great. If we were great on defense, it made it a lot easier. We could run the ball somewhat. We we're going to be able to run the football. And so I don't want to be, you know, when I tell people I'm not an air raid coach, but I do understand the air raid. I learned it. And I have tremendous respect for Hal Mummy. You know, we're not friends or friendly, but I have tremendous respect for him and what he did. I had tremendous respect for what Mike Leach did. I just didn't want to be just that. One dimension. I want to win. Yeah. I want to help high school coaches to win because here's what I know. The reason my business has made it 23 years is because we try to be honest. We tell people the truth. We're, we're, we're hardcore. We believe in details, coaching the little things. We try to give them every single tool that they need to be successful. And we know that Denwoody, Virginia is going to be different than Hoover High School. We know that Raceland High School is going to be different than Morro Bay in California. So Billy right now has got a quarterback that is a phenomenal runner. So if he's true air raid, yeah, that guy's he's not going to run back. the ball except four or five times scrambling in a game. Yeah. But Billy wants to win a state championship. So it just so happened, you know, he wins, goes 15 and 0 and averages 50 something points a game because – he played, he played the game the way that his talent at that school this year is laid out. 
that's what great coaching is. Great coaching mm-hmm. isn't being a wishbone coach, a wing tee coach, an air raid coach. Great coaching is going, okay, I'm in this community. These next two to three years, we have this group of kids coming through. We're going to make sure that we can revise this offense to fit this group of talent for those two to three years so that these kids can maximize and have the best experience and we have a chance to win football games. And that's what I do. Like if I'm if I'm looking at film of Billy, it's a whole lot different than if I'm looking at film of Raceland, Kentucky. If I'm looking at my old high school, Caldwell County High School, it's different than looking at film in Hoover, Alabama. Because one group's two platooning with 180 players. Another group has got 28 players out, and all kids are good or playing both ways on the side of the ball. So I could give them a play sheet and say, yeah, you need to run all these plays. Yeah. Okay, so here's all these plays. And they're like, well, when are we going to practice defense? <laughs> uh, when are we going to do special teams? Because, you know, this is a, like a 12 hour a day plan here, you know, because all of our guys are having to do both ways. So if you've never coached high school football, you don't understand that. So for five years after Kentucky, I was a hired gun. I was going to a school and calling plays on a Friday night of a team that had 25 players. The next Friday night, I might be at Hoover helping rush with 170 players. Wow. It's a completely different animal than what it was then. So it was the greatest coaching experience ever is that your brain having to flick and operate and change and all this other stuff. Yeah. So I tell guys out there all the time, if you're a young coach, you want to be an offensive coordinator, you want to be a play caller, you know what you need to do? Practice calling plays. Every day. Well, how do I do that, coach? Every time that you're out on the field and the coaches are calling plays and you got a script and all that stuff, listen, learn, and all that, but then call the play yourself. Mm. Look at the formation, call it yourself. When you're at home and you're watching a game, have your notepad in front of you as you're watching Kentucky and Tennessee play. Third and one, what am I going to call? Yeah. Third and two, what am I calling? Opening script, what am I calling? Write them down, call them down. Neil Brown used to make a game plan in 2006 and 2007 at Troy. He would walk into me, handwritten out on a little yellow legal pad. He'd walk in, hand it to me. I'd look at it. I'd say, thank you, Neil. I appreciate it. He'd walk away. I'd look at it for about 30 seconds, throw it in the trash can, and then I'd go back and do my thing. Neil knew that. He knew that I took an idea or two from his. He knew that 99% of what I was doing, he wasn't going to do. You know what he was doing? He was practicing for that day that I left. So that that day that I left, he was ready. Mm -hmm. Larry Blakely, Larry Blakeney knew that he was ready. And so Neil had gotten his 10,000 hours in since being a high school, the son of a high school coach. Yeah. Practicing calling. So you can get your 10,000 hours in before you ever call your first play. Wow. And then when you start calling them, all of a sudden you'll find out it wasn't as easy as it was when I wasn't calling. Yeah. I mean, you're so right because like Billy, I, I've never told you this before, but when you were at Rockbridge, I got tape on you and you were running all that air raid stuff. You, but you were not running the ball. I'm so like, dude, you were running that air raid stuff at Rockbridge. You weren't running the quarterback, but I remember watching you your first year and you had two quarterbacks and and I said, man, I said, that other kid that's playing outside linebacker, he should be the quarterback. <laughs> and once you put him at quarterback, the game changed. So, like, when did you figure out that you had to run the ball? Because you really weren't at one time, Coach Mills. What, was it because of Coach Franklin? And if, if it's because of Coach Franklin, wh- why did you figure it out? Was I mean, I want you to tell the story about when you got let go at Auburn, too, because that's a great story. So, does any of this lead into that? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I was a defensive coach my whole life. I mean, I, I mean, I played defense. I started coaching defense. I was known as a defensive coach. I spoke at clinics on defense. I mean, that was it. I mean, and, and when I got my, I guess would be my second head coaching job at Rockbridge, I was a defensive coach. I hired offensive coaches. I didn't have anything to do with the offense. I mean, uh, you know, I might coach quarterbacks on leadership stuff. But that'd be about it. And then, but, you know, when I came to Dinwiddie, 
offensive coordinator, who's now my O-line coach here, uh, you know, he he didn't want to go with me. He went back to Troy. I mean, went back to Kentucky as an offensive coordinator at Bull County. And I couldn't find an offensive coach. So come down to it, I had to do it. And the, uh, uh, you know, I had uh, the playbooks and all that, and I looked at it, and it was it was it was this piece kind of pieced together. And uh, I felt like I wasn't really running a system; I was just running some plays. And mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, that's that's kind of what led me to Tony's system is because I knew what I was doing defensively was a system, and I wanted that same thing offensively. And uh, you know, really, it's what it came down to. Uh, that other kid played quarterback because when I came into, I tried to establish the off season program and how important it was to it. And the other kid was there more, you know, and he was older and, you know, he deserved that shot and he got that shot and then he lost it. And then that kid stepped in and never looked back, broke every record in Virginia high school league history. And, you know, some, yeah. he still holds to this day, uh, you know, but, you know, at that point it was about throwing the football. And, but going back to the same thing that we talked about earlier, it was that because if you remember, Adam was also my leading running runner uh, because we didn't really have a uh, what I would consider a, a strong running back. Uh, so he was also my leading rusher, kind of the way that Harry was this past year. You know, Harry was our leading rusher, and I didn't let him run the ball in, in probably three games uh, or even more than that when it gets down to all the second halves he didn't play. I mean, the kid didn't play in the second half of – he didn't play in eight quarters this year. And I didn't let him run the ball in in eight more. So, I mean, he still rushed for almost 2,000 yards. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it, it's about what those kids can do, you know. And uh, uh, what 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 Kerry was able to do throwing the ball this year, that was kind of stumbled upon. But, you know, once I figured it out that, man, he really sees the field fast, you know. Hmm. And then it was on. So uh, I was going to put you in a position where, you know, you had to make choices defensively, you know, that might be gambles and then, you know, allow Harry to take advantage of those those gambles. And, uh, you know, it's always been since day one about, you know, what can you guys do? And, you know, also understanding your own limitations. And, you know, I'll do the same thing in anything, whether it comes to the weight room, uh, speed program, you know, I'm going to go out and find the best. I mean, I, I never have understood people not thinking that way. I mean, I can remember my – we had to get over the hump in uh, uh, in 2007 when we won our first championship. Um, I think you'd already – no, you were still at – were you still at uh, Meadowbrook at the time? 2008, y'all beat uh, Meadowbrook, and I was at Amelia. Okay, never mind. It was. Uh, I, I remember the game. Two thousand seven, we lost though, uh, but we beat we beat Matoka. You remember Matoka was the team. They had me. Oh seven, and oh seven, and then oh yeah. six and oh seven. They were the team. You know. Oh yeah. Um, but we beat them, and part of the reason we beat them was was uh, I took film down to Troy when we went down there to camp, and I'm like, hey, can you watch some film here? You Six know? five cover zero. Yeah, I was like he was ever, ready for it. Yeah, have you ever seen this stuff? And he's like, Yeah, he said, I've seen it. And, we and Tony, it. Tony gave me some ideas, and we, we sit down and we did an opening script, and I used that bad boy and yeah. we burned them up. And I can remember they came out, I mean, Dale came out in the paper like I was breaking the rules or something because I went out and got help. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's funny, you know, but uh, live by the blitz, die by the blitz, exactly, whatever it takes to win, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try to find every avenue, every trainer, every trainee uh, that we can. And, and Tony has been uh, has been incredible to our program because of that. You know, and I mean, when he when he, I mean, I, I've been with him all the way through the three sixty five, the the zooms, the everything. And then he said he was going to re, you know basically going to retire. I understood. I mean, he deserves it more than anybody does. But but at the same time. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, been, it's been, uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm, we may have had more contact since he retired than, than yeah. we had when we, when he weren't, you know, but, uh, you know, he's came up here, uh, watched the game. Uh, it was incredible. We're playing Hopewell and he's, 
you know, Tony's on the sideline. He sees something and he wants to tell me. And then, then all and then he just see the says, he says, hey, send the guy, send you back behind motion right there, throw the street. I'm like, dude, right now, I've got to sit it right in. Touchdown, you know, 60 You're yards. Smart. You know? You're smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, I, I remember Shane, he got the email last year, Coach Franklin, that said that you was going to totally get out of it. No mm -hmm. more of the system. And I called Billy, and Billy didn't even know. I mean, do you remember that, Billy? When you thought it was all over with and you hadn't even heard, and I called you. And when when Coach Franklin, I, do you remember that, Coach Franklin? Like you sent an yeah, email. Well, and he was, uh, I saw I saw the same email you did. Oh, uh, yeah, man. It was like someone had died. What I, was, basically, what I did was that there was a, there was a, you know, you go through all these stages of life, um, things going on, and um, I didn't know if I wanted to create anymore just with football. And I knew that um, there were some limitations with, you know, not coaching anymore. And um, and so, you know, there was a lot of other stuff too. You know, I'd gone through just, a, just, just the worst nightmare ever the last season of coaching. Um, and so there was a lot of things going on in life at that time. And, um, you know, so I did, you know, I'd done this thing, a 365 deal where every day I would send out you know, information. I kind of enjoyed doing that, but it was, it was a lot of, a lot of work to try to, for me to get 20 to 30 minutes of stuff. And, and yeah. I did a lot of time studying other people um, all of last year, which was really good for me. I got every, I got every college game I wanted to get and I was able to pull stuff up and find a lot of good stuff that I shared. I shared with these guys and stuff. And then I kind of threw all my library and I put it in and it was almost 600 hours yeah. in my library. And that's what Billy said. Billy's, probably yeah. spent a hundred thousand dollars over the years with all the stuff that he's done with kids to camp and all this. And here I was all of a sudden selling my 600 hours of information for 3000 when he spent a hundred thousand for it. So, you know, he's like, <laughs> hell no, I don't want you to give it, you know, giving it any way, but long story short, I went back, I went back. I didn't want that rotten taste in my mouth that I had the last year I coached. And I went back this year and, and fell in love with football again. Wow. I went to West Point. Um, the, they play sprint football at West Point, which is every player weighs 178 or less on game day. And these are guys that are in the military that are, you know, going to donate. Most of them will spend, you know, eventually spend almost 20 to 30 years in the military. Um, they're the world's – they're the greatest leaders in the world. And the head football coach of that team played for me – in 1983 to 85 at Murray High School in Murray, Kentucky. He was one of my wow. first quarterbacks I ever coached. And he was the head coach. And he asked me to come up. They they had in the last in the last four um, four or five games they played Navy, they had averaged like six points a game. And he had asked me to come up and see if I could help them in the spring. So I went up in the spring, spent five days and kind of reinstalled the offense and got back to the roots of what of what you know that coaching that, is that they wanted to do and and so did that, got tempo and all that stuff. And then when I left, um, the head coach, Mark uh, West, asked me, he's a retired lieutenant colonel. And uh, Mark asked me, he said, will you come back and just do it, you know, just do it for a yeah. year, man. And I said, Mark, I said, I, I, I can't afford to, man. I would love to do it, but I said, I just can't afford to do it. And because uh, it was a small amount of money for them to be able to do it. So anyway, long story short, I told him, I said, I'll find somebody. And I looked everywhere. I, I called eight or 10 guys that I thought, you know, were retired, would go do it. And none of them would do it. And so finally I called Mark and I said, look, I said, I'll do it. I want to do it under one condition. I said, um, I never served my country. Uh, I've always felt guilty about it. I never went to the military. And I said, I'll do it as long as you won't pay me. I don't want a penny. I'm going to wow. do it on my own. And I said, that'll be my way of trying to offer service to, to do something. But I'm going to tell you something. It was the greatest experience. They gave me my life back. They made me feel good as a football coach again, uh, as a human being, working with really good men. I worked with, in all honesty, I worked with the best defensive coordinator I've ever worked with. And I've worked with Will Muschamp. I've worked with Manny Diaz. I've worked with Paul Rhodes. I've worked with every damn coach you can imagine that's the greatest in the world. Yeah. And the defensive coordinator – for the uh, sprint football team uh, at Army was the best defensive coordinator that I had worked with. So why? Wow. 
All this is because to me, when you're a great defensive coordinator, there's a few characteristics that you have. Number one, he was brilliant. I'm talking about smart, brilliant. Okay. Number two, he was a badass. Okay? <laughs> uh, almost every great defensive coordinator I've ever been around is a badass. The kids, they respect him and they fear him. And I never won a practice. I went out every day wanting to win one practice. Before I know how you I feel. He handed me my ass every single day. I don't care how much I cheated, how much I gimmicked, whatever I did. Wow. You know, he was going to beat my ass. And the players played hard. They were simple, yet looked sophisticated, looked complicated, and they would drill your ass. You know, you'd get in seven on seven, and I'd want to fight. I mean, I'd want to fight. I'd want to start brawls every day. I know how you feel. Because – they did the things you're not supposed to do in seven on seven. But let me tell you something, a little yeah, secret. Every badass defensive coordinator does. Yeah. They're all they the should. same. They're all, they're all nasty. They're they all going to get after you and their kids are going to do it. So long story short, um, I learned more about football again. And I wanted to get out and I wanted to do what I'm doing now, which is I'm reconducting seminars again, but I'm on the road doing it. Instead of doing like a gigantic hotel deal, yeah. I wanted to go see coaches again. So I'm doing things like I'm doing at Billy's. On, I can't even remember the date, Billy. It was 17th and 18th. Yeah, March, March 18th, 19th. 18th and 19th. March 18th, 19th. Yeah, so I'm I'm at Billy's place. I'm doing what I call a badass offensive coordinator training um, there on those dates. People can find it on my website, coachtf.com. They can find all the information there. But I'm doing these things all around the country. I'm leaving on – Thursday to go to Texas. Um, and I'm going to be doing with schools working individually. I'm actually going to be doing some old school door to door. I'm going to be going and doing some stuff to where I'm just going to walk up, knock on coaches and say, Hey, you know, I'm here today. Want to talk some ball. Wow. Um, and, you know, build out some coaches coming to a, a Friday night deal where we're set around for a couple of hours and talk football and then try to get them to do one of my deals, you know, one way or another. So I'm getting back and doing things that that I'm good at, um, that coaches wanted me to do. You know, I love Zoom. I think it's the best teaching tool in the world. But every now and then, as my wife tells me, my wife tells me a couple of things. Number one, she says, it's time for you to go. <laughs> you need to get your ass out of the house. You know, you've been here too long. Let's go. Get out of here. And uh, And I need human interaction. Yeah. You know, to go see human beings and to go hang around young people. I don't, you know, high school coaches I love. I love the interaction. I love going and coaching and being with those guys. Uh, I don't miss coaching in college at all as far as the human interaction of that. But what I miss is I miss the human interaction with young people. Young people make me feel young. Mm. I'm 65 and I play press coverage in practice. OK, mm -hmm. if you if you if I come to a place and I'm coaching, I'm coaching. You know, Neil Brown told me when I was at Auburn, I was I was gigantic when I was there. There was a time at Auburn. I weighed about two hundred and fifty five pounds. I know how you Neil feel. Neil told me during spring uh, the first spring I was there, he went, went over and whispered in my ear and he said, hey, dude, he goes, you keep coaching like this, like you're twenty five. You're going to die on the field because you're a fat ass. And you need to lose some weight or else you need to quit coaching like you are. Your wife's going to be a widow. And I'm like, yeah. hey, F you, you little boy. And, you know, <laughs> he was he was right. But I still now, I've always said when I can't coach like a kid, when I can't have that enthusiasm, when I can't get out and demonstrate, then I'll just quit doing it. And I still got – I told eight or ten college coaches this year, I said that, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, what do you think I need to do? Who do I need to hire? And I said, well – you need to fucking hire me, you know? And they're like, uh, they have nothing to say. But they'd like, you, you know, you're damaged goods. I don't want you, you know, I don't want to be around you, you know, your old man, you know, and your damaged goods too. But when you've got that energy, it's, it's always contagious. And to me, that's what young people bring that out of me. Mm -hmm. Young people make me feel young and I love young people. You know, people say young people have changed. Young people hadn't changed. The world's changed. 
internet changed. These little phones here change everything. Young people are still the same. They still want discipline. They want you to teach them how to do it right. They want you to make them do right. And they appreciate it when you do. Sometimes it's hard, but they want all of those things that we wanted when we were growing up. And you can't do that via Zoom. Mm -hmm. You have to be interacting and in their faces and all that stuff. So, you know, I'm doing this selfishly, going out back on the road again to do some stuff. Yeah. Coach Bald here, he's my friend. He's in St. Petersburg. He coached at Lakewood High School. He was a pretty good coach when he coached Isaiah Wynn that starts for the uh, New England Patriots. He wants to know, Coach Franklin, Franklin, can you tell us something about playing football with Bud Foster? Are you guys friends? I can I can tell you the answer to both of those things. I could tell a lot of good stories on Bud Foster that I won't tell because uh, as <laughs> he's he exactly was, what I thought of, Coach, when you he, said what a great he is. He was like me as a child of the seventies, you know. So we were having a good time. And let yeah. me tell you this: when Bud when Bud walked in the door at Murray State, Bud was one year behind me. I was a sophomore, and Bud but Bud was a freshman coming in. And from the moment that he got there, he had a quality about him that was recognizable, That was, and that was that he was a leader. Everybody kind of – they kind of – you know, a guy walks in the door and everybody's attached to him. And when Bud yeah. walked in the door, people were attached to Bud from the moment that he showed up. Yeah, the Murray State Racers, yeah. baby. Coach, I'm, yeah. a big, I'm a big John Morant fan, Coach. Big yeah. John Morant fan. Didn't I even know who he him, was man. until last year, Coach. And then Bud and I, uh, Bud and I have not, we're not friends. We haven't maintained a relationship. I know Bud, if I, if I, you know, send him a message, he would always be kind and send back. Or if he sent me one, I would do the same. Uh, I would love to have coached with Bud. Um, I admire the fact that Bud stayed as a defensive coordinator for all those years and never left. He's a lot like me and that he kind of had his own unique perspective. But the fact that you could stay at one place for that many years uh, I admire anybody that can do that. It's not something I had in me. I'm one of those guys that get antsy and I'm ready to leave after a couple of years. But he's a he's a really good human being, and he was a phenomenal football coach, and he was really good for the game, and obviously a great ambassador for Murray State. Right. Jim Tim here, y'all. Jim Tim has been following this clinic, this podcast, since I started on LinkedIn. He's the only guy that watches LinkedIn. But he is from East Strasburg. He's up in – uh, Rochester, New York, and he wants to know what is y'all's greatest lesson. And Coach uh, Coach Mills, would you like to tell Jim Tim what is your greatest lesson? And Coach Franklin, you got to tell the story after Coach gets done about the Auburn getting let go. That's a classic, Coach. All right. What's your greatest uh, lesson, Billy Mills? Uh, I think probably one of the greatest lessons I ever got was coaching a, a young man in Florida who was a tremendous talent. Uh, you know, he, uh, I came in, he was already talented. Um, I didn't really have to do a whole lot. I was coaching D line, uh, coaching uh, wide receivers and special teams coordinator and then defensive coordinator ended up, but, um, uh, you know, me and this kid butted heads. I mean, uh, oh. he, he was about talent, and uh, I, I was trying to let him know that, uh, you know, he had to he, – he could still get better. Uh, he didn't really want to hear that. Um, you know, and, and uh, we ended up losing the kid. Now, I ended up coaching the kid. He ended up quitting, but I ended up coaching the same kid in, in weight room. Uh, they have – they have a – Competition lifting in Florida, it's, uh, cling and jerk and um, and bench press. Paul's bench press. This kid bench. This kid Paul's bench press five, uh, you know five something. Oh, wow. That's a lot, man. But um, you know I can remember the head coach, uh, Emma Sherman. It's kind of like Emma. Emma was uh, never. I never saw Emma mad ever. I never saw Emma really get in. You know really. Fired up ever. He was always calm, controlled, kind of like working for Andy Griffin. And uh, if anybody remembers who that guy was. Yeah, I remember him. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. he told me, he said, hey, take his kid home. He said, take his kid home today. You know, so I take kid home and I get home. Kid's got a 
got a blanket uh, for a door and uh, has a dirt floor yeah, on his house. That's where he's living. Kids living there. And, uh, you know, you know, I started to realize why them little grade sheets that I gave him, you know, didn't really make, make a big, you know, <laughs> big, <laughs> big deal to him. Kid had, kid had a whole lot more going on, you know. So I think, uh, you know, learning to teach the kid, you know, from the inside out, you know, coach the kid from the inside out, know where the kid's coming from. You know, that was probably one of the best lessons I ever got because, you know, as a young coach, you know, you're just X's and O's and game plans and this, that, and the other. And, you know, there's a whole lot more going on in this, in this life than that that uh, mm. some kids got to deal with. I thought that was a good lesson I learned. What you think, Coach Franklin? Well, I'll give two quick ones. Uh, one is a story uh, called Johnny Cobra. Uh, and when I retired from coaching in college football at Middle Tennessee, I wrote a, a little farewell deal and I talked about mm -hmm. a player called Johnny Cobra and Johnny Cobra was not the player's name, but Johnny Cobra was a kid that we all know as high school coaches, he's walking the hallways. He's got some glasses that don't quite fit him. Right. He's a weakling. He's um, maybe another nationality. Um, maybe not from this country. There's something about him that, that everybody, he's an easy mark. He's not involved in anything. He's not a part of anything. And football saved me by watching what football did for Johnny Cobra. Is that Johnny Cobra came out. He was the worst player I've ever coached to this day. Uh, couldn't play anywhere for anybody. And uh, but Johnny Cobra came out in practice and tried. And all the players one day in a one-on-one -on -one drill, he jumped in and went against the best player. He gets killed, but he went and he jumped up and his helmet's turned sideways. He's looking out that ear hoe and all the players are jumping all over him. And he's like, you know, I want to go again. And from that moment forward, Johnny Cobra walked those hallways with a team. Johnny Cobra was part of the team. Johnny Cobra, nobody bullied Johnny Cobra anymore because if they did, there was about 35 other guys they were going to go find whoever that bully was and they were going to take care of business. And many years later, as Johnny Cobra now is in his fifties, I look at his life and I kept, we've connected and we still talk about the same things that we talked about when he was in my classroom through social media. And I look at him and I'm proud of the fact that he has a life that he feels good about himself and that all of those old teammates, they still connect with him. That's the thing about this game, is this game can make us all feel important by being a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And the final thing is, is that I learned that it's never too late to say that you're sorry. Mm. Uh, because um, number one, you have to admit when you're wrong, and sometimes you don't know right away that you're wrong. Sometimes it's a year later, two years later. Well, I did something, I was wrong as a young head coach. It bothered me for years and years and years. And just a few years ago, about 25 or 30 years later, I had an opportunity. I was in the community where this young man lived that I had done wrong when he was a player for me. And through a coach that was there, I was able to connect with one of his family members and went to their house, the family member, to tell them how sorry I was that I made this mistake and that it had eaten at me and I just wanted, I wanted their forgiveness. That's what I wanted. And she said, well, why don't you tell him yourself? I'm going to get him over here. And she called him and he came to the house and I was able to look somebody in the eye and say, you know what? I was a young coach. I thought I was right and I was wrong. And um, I just want to tell you as a man uh, that I was wrong. And I am so sorry because I know that it was a hard thing for you and how it affected your life. And I just want your forgiveness. Um, and he forgave me. And so my point is, is that sometimes as coaches or as men, macho, we don't want to admit that we made a mistake or that we were wrong. And I think that one of the best things that as a real leader, 
And as a human being that you can do is to go, you know what, I was wrong and I need to try to make this right if I can. Not to expect the fact they may not forgive you, but you need to admit that you're wrong. And then if possible, then look at that person and apologize for being wrong. And I think that as football coaches and as football players, et cetera, sometimes those things are hard to do. So anyway, that's the things for me. Yeah, so uh, Jim Tim said, thank you so much. Jim's so loyal. And th the reason I was able to get, uh, you know, both of these great coaches on is because Coach Franklin is coming to the Richmond area in Virginia. He's coming to Dinwiddie High School. And I got it there at the bottom of the screen. I, I didn't do my homework and I didn't make sure I had that on, but everybody can see it. March 18th and 19th, Dinwiddie, Virginia. Coach Franklin is coming. He's putting that offensive coordinator boot camp. Uh, coach Mills, what what can a, a young coach? I mean, I already have my good friend Shane. He's already signed up. He's going to be there. What what can a young coach or any coach expect if they come to Dinwiddie for those two days? Well, I can remember um, probably about I don't know two or three months ago. Tony called me, or I called him, but we were talking, and he ran this by me. And, and as he ran it by me, I could see uh, all the things that we had done over the years kind of culminating into one kind of deal there. Kind of like he took the best of everything mm. and put it together. I know he had the uh, – at one point when he was at uh, Middle Tennessee State, we had the uh, – we had the magic, uh, the position magic things. And – there was a lot of walkthrough, a lot of detail, you know, and, you know, and then we had the seminars, but this is kind of putting all of it together. Uh, more, more of a, this is why you're calling these plays, uh, the details of them, the walkthrough, having allow getting your quarterbacks in there to kind of, you know, see the whole process and, and, and hear it firsthand. You know, and, uh, you know, really, I mean, I mean, you don't have to, you know, convince my quarterbacks because they, they know the, they know the history. They know that, you know, that, that, that what, what Tony in this system has meant to our school. But, uh, you know, you have that validation with that being right there, uh, taking you through it, showing you the details, what really makes the plays work and how, how it affects the defense. I'm just excited. Cause you know, I told him, I said, I will. I, I've been having my uh, withdrawals from not having my seminar fix. You know, it's just something you get into that you're doing every year. But I'm excited about it because I feel like not only am I getting uh, something that top notch to what I would normally you know drive eight, nine, ten hours to go to, it's coming right here to Dinwiddie. Um, you know, but we're gonna we're gonna get that right here. Uh, for, for, I know, I know several, uh, programs are coming. Shane being one of them. I know, uh, coach, at, coach, uh, you know, coach at Battlefield, he says, reached out to me as well. And, uh, a few other coaches. So a lot of people are going to, uh, experience some, uh, some good stuff, you know, and some, some things that's going to really change the scoreboard for you this fall and, uh, really change as a coach. Well, the good thing too is is that the the small group, the fact that it's a small group, is so much different. Like seminars, I've had seminars before at Opryland with twelve hundred coaches there. Yeah, and uh, there's no time for me to individually do stuff. Whereas these things, we're gonna we're gonna walk through stuff. And I've encouraged these guys that when you come to bring your quarterback, can you imagine a quarterback having two days sitting in on the same thing as if he were a coach? Yeah, he's standing there with him, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna have him walk through stuff, and I'm gonna train his brain and be able to do that. So it's exciting for me to do it. And again, I was the re-energized that I got being at Army this past year with the sprint football team and being able to coach and teach again, uh, and to watch young people learn again. It's gonna be fun. I mean, Jim Reed, who's been everywhere, Coach. I I don't know if you know. You probably do, Coach. She he's been everywhere, but I talked to him this football season and he's at Maritime Academy. And I said, coach, how do you like it? He said, I love it. He, I think he feels the same way that you felt coach going to um, West Point. He was like, um, 
he was like revived that there's good kids out there that do what they're supposed to do. You ain't got to chase them around. They're not divas. They actually love the game and they want to play. So yeah. Coach Reed feels the same way. You know, Coach Mills, we're about done. But I, is there anybody like Coach Reed that that you would like to, you know, say thank you to an honest college coach, someone that does it the right way? You know, there are some some good guys out there. Coach Reed, Coach Cavanaugh, Coach Hanson, anybody out there that you can think of before we sign off? Oh, wow. Um, I mean – Coach Reed would definitely be one of the first ones. I mean, guy told you the truth every time you saw him. And uh, you know, I I remember uh I went up to Boston with my young with my youngest uh, to his college thing and shoot, I got a cab for he he was 50, 50 miles in a cab. I wasn't really uh, educated on cabs being from Dinwiddie. We don't have a lot of cabs. But, uh but uh Went to see him. You know, we talked ball all day and got up taking me to the airport. I mean, Coach Reed's top notch. Coach Hanson uh, and all the places he's been. Um, you know, there, there's a ton of guys out there like that. Uh, you know that 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 are uh, that are old school. That they they still tell you that tell you the truth when they come in to visit. But uh, you know, those guys would definitely be two of the the, the major ones that I would mention. Uh, uh, JC. You know, J.C. Price at uh, at Tech, Virginia Tech. I mean, I've known J.C. when he was at JMU. Then he went to Marshall. And he, he's always recruited our schools. And, uh, you know, they, they, they always shoot straight with you, and that's, that's always appreciated. So, you know. Coach Franklin, could you end us off with the Auburn story when you got let go? I mean, that's just a great story. Um, well, I mean, the Auburn deal was, it was a weird deal from the beginning. Um, you know, I actually, I think two of the first three podcasts I do for people go to the coach, Tony Franklin podcast, listen to episodes two and three, and you will hear about four hours of a story <laughs> that is, uh, so I can't do it justice from yeah. here, but you know, the bottom line is, is that, um, it was a, it would be like, you married somebody that you met in a bar uh, and you knew her for an hour and you both were attracted to each other. And then you got home and you found out, wow, we got nothing in common and we don't like each other. And wow. so um, that was kind of it. It was just a bad fit. It was a bad fit all the way around. And, and uh, you know, I learned a lot from it. The best thing that ever happened to me. I always tell every wow. coach that gets fired. Anytime a coach gets fired for the first time, I tell them, you know, I'll call, I'll pick up the phone if I know them and I'll call them and I'll say, you know, number one, I feel for you and it's OK. You need to feel bad for yourself for a while. Take a few hours, take a few days and feel bad for yourself. Be angry. Be ready to kill somebody. All that. All the things that you feel have all that. Don't let people say you shouldn't feel that way. You should. It's fine. Yeah. But one once it's over with. Once you've gone through a few days of this, just remember, nobody really cares. <laughs> nobody, no, nobody, everybody's going to act like they do. But like <laughs> in college, like at Auburn, for example, when I got fired, I had people call me and they would literally, this is true. They would literally say, man, I can't believe that, that SOB, what they do that for. Hey, you think I can get that job? Who do you think I should talk to? <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about it, the ink ain't dry and, and it's already like that way. But you know, the big thing, um, when you get fired, if you if you do it the right way, you eventually look in the mirror, you tell yourself the truth, and it will be the best thing that ever happened to you if you tell yourself the truth. You'll get better. It'll make you a better coach. I mean, the next year I'm at Middle Tennessee, we win 10 games, which is the most in the history of the school still to this day. They've never won more than eight since they've been a Division I school, but that year we won 10. The next year I go to Louisiana Tech and the third year there, or the second year we win the WAC. The third year we average 52 points a game. Mm. We create these little things that eventually people are calling RPOs that I didn't even know what that was. Like Billy said, I used to make Billy and them sign something saying they wouldn't tell anybody. Yeah. And that gets us to Cal, where I then get to coach three years at a place that I loved and enjoyed being in Berkeley, California. I get to coach Jared Goff. I helped recruit Jared at the end coaching for three years, number one pick in the draft. We break every record in the history year, 100 years of playing football there. None of that would have happened without me getting fired 
mm. at Auburn. I wouldn't have learned what I learned without getting fired at Auburn. So all the wonderful things that could have happened to me happened because I got fired. Think about this. Sonny Dykes just played for a national championship yeah. at TCU. That would not have happened if Cal hadn't have fired him the year after I left. Wow. Getting fired by Cal helped Sonny to get to a national championship game because I promise you he became a much better head coach after getting fired, having to go sit for a year under Gary Patterson and watch Gary, even though Gary would then get fired. But if Gary doesn't get fired, Sonny doesn't get that job. And Sonny learns that SMU gets better as a coach. And then he gets to play for a national champ. So if you look at it the right way, get bitter, get angry, get mad, want to kill people, all the normal stuff, but then go look at the mirror and say, what part of this should I own? How can I get better? What can I do to be better? And then own it. And that's what I did. And it made me a better coach. Yeah. Coach Tatum down here, he, he's the O-line coach in North Carolina, coach. He's sharp. He came on and talked about counter power. He says, legends, so much wisdom in one day. See, Coach Tatum, he's only 26 years old. You're smart because you're listening to these guys that have been there and they've done it. Coach Franklin, I'm going to let you end us off. On the 18th and 19th, what can a coach expect that's going to be um, coming to your boot camp? Let me, let me say something real quick before Tony yeah. ends us here. It's not just going to be at our place now, guys. Uh, if you're near – I know this is uh, – na- you went national now, ain't yeah. you? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I don't know where. It get, these guys could be anywhere. So, yeah, go, go ahead, Coach. Tell them everywhere you're going to be. It's going to be in Houston, Texas. Uh, if you go to the website down there, uh, let's see, coachtf.com slash boot camp. It says all the places, but he's going to be in Houston. He's going to be in uh, Man, Man, is that Mannheim, Pennsylvania? Yeah, um, Mannheim. I'll be at West Point. I'll be yeah. at, uh, in California, and there'll probably be some more places. I'm going to. I'm actually going to do a, a deal with a school this weekend down in the DFW area. Uh, so, and I'll, I'm going to be creating as I go along. But yeah, I mean, I'll definitely do that. But if somebody comes. Uh, or if somebody hires me independently just to do something just with their school, here's what you can expect with me is that when you walk, when I walk away, you will have information that will change your life and change your career. Now it'll change your career as a football coach and it'll change your life as a human being, because I've got 41 years of learning that I give to you in a way that you can understand And so I can tell you this, and Billy knows this. Billy's one of my greatest examples. I've got young coaches that came to me as young coaches that are now in college that are making millions of dollars. I've got high school coaches throughout the country right now that were making $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 as a high school coach. Some of them are making between $150,000 to $300,000 as a high school coach. I've got guys that went from 0-10 to 10-0. My point is this, is that I'm a really good teacher. I'll teach it simple. It will change your life. It'll change your career. It'll make you a better play caller. It'll make you a better human being and a better coach. And if it doesn't, then you ain't going to pay nothing. So, you know, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. I mean, I interviewed Chip Lindsey. Yeah. And I mean, he got through his career and then he said, I called Tony Franklin. And I said, I got Tony Franklin coming on. And I, what year was it? It was only. Chip, Chip was a client of mine. He was at Colbert Heights High School, a little old school in northern Alabama. And he called one day and, and decided to come. And he came and was a client, started winning. And then he asked me once, he said, man, he goes, I really want to really want to move up in my career. He said, what do I need to do? And I said, I tell you what, I'm going to call Rush Probes. And I'm going to ask him to hire you as his quarterback coach. He goes to Hoover quarterback coach, then OC, goes to a high school in, in Georgia, does well there. And then I think Gus hired him from there to be off the field guy. Then he goes to Southern Miss. And Chip and I have got a great relationship. And he's been – as a matter of fact, if you go to CoachTF.com, you'll see Chip's audio testimonial on there. Hmm. You'll see Billy's testimonial. You'll see uh, uh, Jeff Trailer, who's now the head coach at UTSA. Uh, Jeff Trailer called me once. When I was at Mill and said, hey, man, we win 12, 13 games a year. 
we average about 40 points a game, but I can't get over the hump. If I come to your deal, you think we can do better and finally get over the hump? I said, come on up here, brother. And he got in a private plane, flew up from Texas, came up. We spent a couple of days together. That next year, Gilmer High School goes 16-0, and 0, averages over about 55 points a game. And he's now making four million a year. So just <laughs> nice testimonial as well. Uh, but all these guys were talented, like Billy. And we're just able to give you a little bit of an edge, give you something that other people don't have. And that's the best thing about doing this deal. So I really appreciate, Troy, what you're doing. Uh, there's a reason that you're growing fast in your podcast. And you're doing a great service for, for high school football coaches. And if a college coach was smart, <laughs> uh, they would listen. Uh, and it's good to see that you've had guys like Gene Chiswick um, um, and uh, some of the other guys that you've told me that you've had on. It's good to see those guys come on and serve, um, you know, guys that, that, that come on and give some time to where that high school coaches can come on and get some information. And, you know, that's one of the things I've learned on Twitter is that, you know, my Twitter account has grown from about five or 6,000 followers to over 15,000 when I changed one thing. I quit looking for what people could do for me. Mm. And I started looking at what I could do for people. Mm. So every day on Twitter, I try to give something that I ask myself, if I was a quarterback coach out there today, what could I say that would help a guy? Mm. If I was an old line coach, what could I say today that would help a guy? If I was an offensive coordinator today, what could I put on there that could help a guy? And so when I started doing that and putting information on there that would make you a better coach, that day, everything started going through the roof. And now I've got over 15,000 people. And it's all because I quit trying to see what people could do for me. And I started asking what I could do to serve other people. And so now they're getting little tidbits along the way that help them. And then, you know, for me, I'll get something from that that'll come back to me tenfold. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. your philosophy. What is it, Coach? Get, do get good, no life. repay, man. Say it again. It. Do good, no repay. Do good, no repay. Play. Right. Yeah, so thank you, Coach. Rat Coach, our sponsor. It, basically, Rat Coach is a computer program that you basically have Billy Mills as your strength coach. It's regimented. It's disciplined. I mean, it's like hiring Billy Mills to be your strength coach, the best coach in Virginia. But y'all, stay on here. I'm going to end it. Um, but so we can just talk for a little bit. I know, but y'all are the best, man. Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. Appreciate it.